Good day, everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Yeshua, our Messiah. The name of this broadcast is Cross the Border, and I'm Nicholas. We're continuing our trek through the scripture here, uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. Uh, last time uh, we left off, uh, we left off of 1 Samuel and I made the decision to just uh, continue on through because it is a continuing story. So I'm picking up in 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 1. So I'll jump right in here. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag. Now, of course, the slaughter of the Amalekites was the Amalekites slaughtering Israel. <clears throat> and, of course, Saul, the king, and his sons perished in the battle. So, And we uh, read part of this last time, but that was at the end of my study on uh, 1 Samuel. So to get a fresh start with a new... Uh, file. We're going to st we're starting back at the uh, very beginning of the chapter here, so we'll go through a little bit of it again. And it's always good to get back in context by backing up a little bit. So David said, "From whence comest thou?" Nope. Back up a little bit more here. Um, it came to pass on the third day that a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. It means he was dirty. And, uh, and so it was, when he came to David, he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said to him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said to him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And the news moved slow in those days. It was three days. And David uh, is inquiring of the matter. He says, I pray thee, tell me. And he answered that the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David said to the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? In other words, is this hearsay, or did you see it with your own eyes? And the young man told him, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, Behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. So this guy's not even an, uh, a child of Israel. Uh, he said to me, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. Now, if you read uh, 1 Samuel, the end of the, uh, the book there, you'd realize that this none of this really happened, that we have another account where Saul asked his armor-bearer to slay him, and his armor-bearer would not do it. So he fell upon his own sword because uh, his injuries were so grave that uh, he feared more being taken captive in the situation he was than to, uh, to bring about the inevitable death that was upon him. So he fell upon his own sword, and then his armor-bearer, also being wounded, fell upon his sword. And, uh, of course, his sons were killed there on the hill before him, too. So if you could imagine the state of mind of Saul at that time, seeing his son slain and knowing that his own injuries are unto death and just, you know, falling on his sword to bring about that inevitable because it would be far worse to be abused in the state he's in by the enemies if they find him. But this guy here, he's going to take credit for killing Saul, the enemy of David thinking perhaps that he's going to get some reward or position or something like that. Well, he will get his reward. And let's read on and see what his reward is. 
So I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live. After that he was fallen, and I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and had brought them hither to my Lord. Basically, he looted the king. Then David took on and took the loot, of course, as evidence of the word that he was bringing, that he slew the enemy of David, that being Saul. And David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. And David said to him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said to him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth has testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul, and over Jonathan his son. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah to use the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Lest the daughter of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offering, for there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, turn not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, Thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love was to me wonderful, passing the love of of women. How are the mighty fallen, and the weapons of war perished. So David's epitaph is uh, remembrance of Saul and especially Jonathan, his uh, dear friend. Second Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go? And he said, Unto Hebron. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead, and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that you have shown this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I also will requite you this kindness, because you have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened, and be ye valiant, for your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. 
But Abner, the son of Mer, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, Mahanaim, and made him king over Gilead, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and reigned two years, but the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner the son of Ner, the son of Ish, the and the servants of Ish both Sheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, the, and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let thy young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. And there arose and went over by number twelve of, of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught every one his fellow by the head, and thrust his sword in his fellow's side, so they fell down together. Wherefore that place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is in Gibeon. Now, you can when they said uh, arise uh, and play, uh, they were playing pretty rough. It sounds like they were playing for keeps. And there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. Of course, the division being, being between Israel and Judah, and the tribes that were aligned with Judah, and the tribes that were aligned and called Israel. So there was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, the men of Israel, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. And there were three sons of Zeruiah, there Joab, Abishai, and Azahel, and Asahel was a light of foot as a wild roe. And Asahel pursued after Abner, and in going he turned not to the right hand, nor to the left from following Abner. And Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou Asahel? And he answered, I am. And Abner said to them, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside <clears throat> from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, Turn thee aside from following me, wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab, my, thy brother? Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there, and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died and stood still. Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner. And the sun went down, and they were come to the hill of Ahma, that lieth before Gia, by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner, and because, and became one troop, and stood on the top of a hill. And Abner called to Joab, and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And Joab said, As God liveth, unless thou hast spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone up every one from following his brother. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the people stood still, and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain, and passed over Jordan, and went through all Bithron, and they came to Mahanaim, 
And Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants nineteen men, and as a hell. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and Abner's men, so that three hundred and threescore men died. And they took Ahazahel and buried him in the sepulchre of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at the break of day. So basically what we have there is a provocation between the tribes. Of course, David on one side and uh, the, the, the side called Israel, and the tribes aligned uh, with the, that side of the kingdom. Uh, they provoked a fight. There was a fight, and more of them fell in the fight. And in the end, they averted an all-out war and went home. So we, go, we move on to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. This is a, a history of Israel, basically, with names and people and places and everything. Reminds me of how many people write to me or make comments on my videos on YouTube, and I get those deriding me for believing in a book of fantasy. Well, it is a book of history. They are the ones who believe in a fantasy because there's true history, which I'm reading to you here, and then there's the, well, washed, watered-down history that they read in their books, which leaves out all of this history. I mean, every history class should at least segregate the, par segregate the parts of the scripture that are history and study them as they are history. Uh, but basically what they teach as history is a synopsis uh, with a twist for whoever controls the history books. And I wonder who's in charge of the curriculums in America. Well, I guess I don't even have to say it. There's, uh, what, 28 uh, major universities that seem to control everything else as far as academics go. And that goes from what's in the public school books to what's taught in even the Protestant seminaries. So you figure it out. Okay, we're moving on here. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Now it says, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. Of course, that ended with David's death. Uh, I mean, with Saul's death. But we see that uh, a war continued with the son of Saul being made king over the northern part of Israel, the northern tribes called Israel, and David being king over, I believe it's Judah, and two or three other tribes. I, I guess I should have looked a little closer into that, but you can check it out for yourself if, you're, if that's uh, an important point to you. Um, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and the firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoen, the Jezreelitess, and his second, Ch Chiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maaka, Maak, or Maaka, I don't know how you pronounce that, let's see, Maaka or Maakoth, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shef, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithrium, by Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Now you see that David already has, uh, well, let's see, let's count the wives here for a minute. Uh, of course, the first one was Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, that's one. Uh, Abigail, that's two, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. The third it was um, Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, uh, king of Geshur. The fourth, um, Haggith. And the fifth, Abital. So we see that he had five wives by this time. Oh, and six. Okay. 
uh, Ithrim by Egla, David's wife. So he had six wives at this time. These were born to David in Hebron. So it's the only way you can get six children born about the same time is to have six wives, apparently. Uh, one woman, the only way one woman could do it is if she had sex tuplets because, you know, you have the, the period of time, nine months, and then, of course, you have until the weaning because there's that natural mechanism that prevents a woman from uh, getting pregnant in most cases uh, while she's nursing a child. That would be far too much, too taxing on the body of a woman. So our Heavenly Father put that mechanism there, that natural birth control. Well, anyway, we'll pick up here when we get back from the break. You're listening to Cross the Border. Visit crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. I'm Nicholas. My website is crosstheborder.org. And uh, please do stop by there. Make sure you watch that short video there. Definitely worth your while. Pass it around. Uh, click on it and go to the YouTube site. Make a, uh, first, uh, make a comment there if you uh, please and uh, take advantage of the, uh, of the other resources, the Bible studies, and other things on my website there. And most of all, take advantage of that email link there just to email me and say, hi, we're listening, uh, we enjoy the program, or we hate the program, or you're totally wrong about this or that, and here's why. Uh, of course, quoting me uh, chapter and verse, because I love to be corrected. And I love to be corrected because I... I like to be correct, so if it takes correcting for me to be correct, then, <laughs> then I, I want to be corrected. We, uh, we're here in chapter 3 of Second Samuel. Let's see, about uh, verse 5, we had counted that David had six wives and had six children about the same time here when he was in Hebron. Uh, verse 6 uh, we don't need to comment much more on that he had six wives. Of course, it was accepted in Israel. It was not a sin for a man to take more than one wife. Uh, sometimes the law required a man to take another wife. So we continue here. And it came to pass in verse 6, while there was war 
between the house of Saul and the house of David that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone into my father's concubine? And that's like a, a concubine is a woman who, is, uh, who belongs to a man. And in Israel, uh, a woman was exclusive to a man. You did not share a woman. No one shared a woman. Uh, all women were exclusive, either that or they were virgins, basically, or they were unmarried and widows in Israel. That's pretty much the way it happened and pretty much the way it was accepted. If a woman was shared by several men, well, then she was called a whore. And if a, if a man went into another man's wife or concubine, uh, that was called adultery. So straightening out some of the terms according to the usage with the, with the law of God here. So do we understand what's going on? Uh, apparently Abner went into, uh, he said, his father's concubine. Well, of course, Saul is dead. So for whatever reason, uh, perhaps the concubine belongs to, uh, to Saul's son. So I guess there's an ownership issue here. And yes, we're talking about, we're talking time context to the scripture. Yes, people did own people. Uh, a father owned his family. He owned his children. Uh, he could sell them if he, if he had to or wanted to. Of course, there was that higher law, and that is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that includes your family. That's supposed to be the overriding factor uh, in the authority structure that uh, we're dealing with here. Or perhaps we're just putting in terms that uh, where the same things are being practiced today, but we're putting it in terms of the time context that seem unpalatable today. Uh, you want to find out who owns your children today? Well, the state thinks they own your children. Uh, just uh, check it out. Uh, the state is telling parents what to do all the time, I was reading some stories uh, yesterday about uh, children being cited in school by stupid teachers, these wicked women that rule over the children of other men and decide that they're a little too rambunctious in class. They're having a hard time sitting still. They're bored to death with the cookie cutter shape that they have to fit into because they can't fall behind and uh, they can't move ahead so they sit there and squirm in their seats because well they're children but it's kind of disruptive so we need to send them to a specialist and we know several specialists that will give them drugs for ADHD and whatever alphabet soup namaker you want to label them with and of course these are terrible drugs that kill children and I've read many stories where the children actually just end up dead overdosing on these drugs that are prescribed by these wicked people and uh, they're forced to by the state because if they don't do it then the state takes the children away especially if there's a state-sponsored broken marriage and I say state-sponsored broken marriage because the state makes it very easy for women to leave their husbands against God's law and to divorce them for no cause at all and will help them and make it easier for them to get their children and collect welfare from the state, become dependent upon the state, while the state pursues their husband for every dime that he earns while depriving him of his children. That's the situation we're in today. So you want to talk about ownership. You think the terms uh, that we're using here that were just normal in the time context of the scripture that we're reading were crude and unpalatable. Well, what we have today is unpalatable. I'm sorry. It's much worse today than it was then. At least then everyone knew where they stood. But today... Well, people have the illusion of freedom. They have the illusion of being the head of their household. But just, you know, look around and watch your step and be wise in the way that you walk. And if you are, if you are, if you are part of a 
state-sponsored broken marriage where you have children, agree quickly before it comes to pass with your um, estranged spouse that you will never allow, either of you will allow your children to be drugged by the state that you will never allow the state to pit you against each other to the destruction of your own children. Use a little wisdom. At least you can come together on that and show your spouse these things first before they come up and then pray that they never come up and you don't have to fight that battle. So anyway, Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ahiah the and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone into my father's concubine? Uh, another thing is, he obviously did not have permission because Ash, uh, talk, Ashbosheth, Saul's son, was now the head of the house according to God's law. And the concubine fell under his headship, she was under his covering. And so he's, he stands here in the position of authority, and his authority has been thwarted by this guy, Abner. So we'll pick up the story there after that long explanation, but I hope that there was something to be learned in it about government then, government today, ownership of children. And uh, yes, I would rather, much rather say I own my children, and they will marry who I say to marry. They will go where I say to go because God's law says children honor your father. It doesn't say honor the state instead of your father. The law has not changed. So Saul's, uh, and when Abner, then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth. So he got angry. What, what, what is this guy saying anything at all? He should have just kept his mouth shut. And he said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul, thy father, to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with fault concerning this woman? So do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so, I do to him to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over the over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba and he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him wow a fearful king he fears the captain of his army but Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf saying whose is the land saying, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. And he said, Well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring me, me call Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. So David's first wife, basically. He's uh, commanding Abner to bring, bring her or not come at all. And David sent messengers to Ish-bosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver my wife, Michal, which I espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ish-bosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Phal-tiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along weeping behind her to Baharum and said Abner unto him, Go return. And he returned. And Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, You sought for David in times past to be king over you. Now then do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. And Abner also spoke in the ears of Benjamin. And Abner went also to speak in the ears of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel, and that seemed good to the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner came to David to Hebron, and twenty-one men with him. 
And David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go, and will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop, and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the hosts that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he has sent him away, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came to thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest Abner the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy goings out and thy comings in, and to know all that thou doest. And when Joab was come out from Deab, David, he sent messenger at, at, messengers after Abner, which brought him again to the, from the well of Sirah, but David knew, knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly, and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all his father's house, and let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. So Joab and Abishai his brother slew Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all, his, all the people that were with him, Rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the bier. And they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king himself, and the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters, as a man falleth before wicked men. Thou so fallest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And when all the people came, to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David swore, saying, So do God to me, and more also, if I shall taste bread, or aught else, till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner, the son of Ner. And the king said to his servant, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Second Samuel chapter 4 and verse 1. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. Of course, we know he was fearful. He feared Abner. And uh, once that uh, he, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? He offended Abner, or Abner offended him, one or the other. Uh, Abner left off being his commander and turned to David. So, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Baana. The name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Rimon, the Beerothite, of the children of Benjamin, for Beeroth also was reckoned to Benjamin. 
and the Beerothites fled to Gitaim and were sojourners there until this day. And of course that would be this day would be the day of the writing of this letter or book as uh, we call it. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. And the sons of Rimon and the Beerothite, Rechab and Beer Baana, went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house as they thought they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib. And Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. Uh, Something about under the fifth rib. Hmm. Must be about where the heart is. So Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. And when they came to the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and got them away through the plain all night. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David in Hebron and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life, and Yahuwah hath avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and of his seed. And David answered Rechab and Baana his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Beerothite, and said to them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity? When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took a hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more, when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed, shall I not thou therefore require his blood of your hand, and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them and cut them off, their hands and their feet, and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. Well, so what's the lesson there? Well, <laughs> you don't, you don't, uh, you don't take it upon yourself to do what you think is right. You know, when you're in an army, you follow orders. When you have a king, you follow the orders of the king. Uh, if you have an idea, you go to the king and you say. Would it please my lord if we went and got the head of uh, the son of Saul? And of course the king would have said absolutely not. And so I guess that's it. You know, that's like us today. Uh, There are many men out there. And you know, Joshua, Jesus talks about them. And after all, he is the king, the king of kings. And he said that in the day, the day of judgment, when all men have to stand before him, and give an account, he says, there's going to be many there that day that will come and say, did I not cast out devils in thy name? Did I not heal the sick? Did I not preach the word of God? Did I not bring, uh, you know, 10,000 souls to the Lord in one day in the great arena? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's what these men basically are doing. They're coming to David and going, look, Look what I did for you. And David's going, I'm sorry, you didn't do it for me. Here's your reward. I never knew you. (coughs) And they got their reward because, well, they were murderers uh, in the case. And if you lie and say, I murdered someone, expecting a reward for your treachery, well, you deserve the same death as a murderer. That's uh, that's what I get out of it. Uh, We'll continue here. In chapter 5, verse 1, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spoke, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in times past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. 
And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. So we see here, finally, the uniting of Israel as one nation under one king, David. You're listening to Cross the Border. We'll be back after the news. Don't go anywhere. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. listening to Cross the Border. That's the name of this broadcast. I'm Nicholas, and we are going through the scripture here. We're in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, and let's see, we'll just pick up at verse 1 there for the sake of continuity. Uh, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spoke, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And in time past, when Saul was king over us, Thou was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And Yahuwah said to thee, And thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was thirty years old, when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty years, thirty and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spoke unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, Thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. 
Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about him from Millo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there were yet sons and daughters born to David. And these be the names of those that were born unto him in Jerusalem, Shamua, and Shobab, and Nathan, and Solomon, Ibhar, also, and Elishua, and Nepheg, and Japhia, and Elishama, and Eliada, and Eliphalet. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed king David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal-perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place baal Perazim, And there, there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba, until thou come to Gezer. Again David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, thirty thousand. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baali of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of Yahuwah of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubim. And it's a, uh, it's, authorized King James Version, or the King James Version, uh, really does not do justice to this verse because it says, they brought up from thence the ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord. When the obvious statement being made is referring to the actual name, Yahuwah, and not the Lord. So, uh, try to read it correctly, especially in that type of context where the reference is absolutely to the name because his name wasn't the Lord. Uh, of course, the being his first name and Lord being his last name, right? No. Like I said, the God whose name is called by the name Yahuwah of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. In chapter uh, 6, verse 3, And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is at Gibeah, 
accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and psalteries and timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come up to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was that when they had bore the ark of the Lord, that, and it was so that when they bore the ark of the Lord, they that bore the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So basically, David had, uh, well, three months to do some homework on uh, how to move the Ark of the Covenant and finally was able to move it. Uh, and as soon as David had made an end of the offering and burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed all the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to the women, as men, and every one a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine, so all the people departed every one to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said to Michal, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father, and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and therefore I will play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be more base in mine own sight, and of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child, unto the day of her death. And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See how I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. So here we have David sitting in his house, and Yahuwah had given him rest about him from all his enemies. The king speaking to the prophet, saying, Now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains, a tent, basically. And Nathan said to the king, do, Go do all that thine heart, that is in thine heart, for Yahuwah, the, the Lord, is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, 
Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt build me a house for me to dwell in. Uh, and that's a question, basically. I need to reread it. Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? There you go. It's a question. Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel, spoke I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people, Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shalt thou say to my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from the following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as formerly. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul whom I put away before thee. And thine house shall be, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O Lord God? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake, and according to thine own heart, hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Wherefore thou art great, Yahuwah, God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people? like Israel, whom God went down to redeem for a people to himself and make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed thyself to thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, Yahuwah of hosts is the God over Israel. And let thine house of thy servant David be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel has revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee a house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, 
and thy words be true, and thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessings let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Chapter 8 of uh, 2 Samuel and verse 1. And after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took meth eg out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured, he put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servant and brought gifts. David smote also hadad Ezer, the son of Rechab, son of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river of Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but reserved of them a hundred chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to Sakkor, Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David slew the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants of David and brought gifts. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer, and brought them to Jerusalem, and from Beta, and from Berothiah, the cities of Hadad Zezer, King David took exceeding much brass. When Toai, the king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hadad Zezer, then Toai sent Joram his son unto King David to salute him and to bless him, because he had fought against Hadad Dezer and smitten him. For Hadadezer had wars with Toai, and Joram brought with him vessels of silver, and vessels of gold, and vessels of brass, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated all of all the nations which he subdued, of Syria, and of Moab, and of the children of Ammon, and of the Philistines, and of Amalek, and the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David, whithersoever he went. And David reigned over all Israel. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And Joab, son of Zeruiah, was over the host. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. And Saraiah was the scribe. And Benaiah, the son of Jehodai, Jehoiada was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief rulers. We'll continue here next time on Cross the Border and pick up in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, verse 1. Visit crossthborder.org, C R O S S, crossthborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie 
with actor nicholas cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin if you want true bible prophecy answers get the book the rapture will be cancelled the author exposes the latin rapture origin the seven-year tribulation deception true bible revelation of daniel's 70 weeks the abomination of desolation the restrainer america in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about god's chosen people and so much more about bible prophecy this book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events get the book the rapture will be canceled visit crosstheborder.org c-r-o-s-s crosstheborder.org to get your print epub or pdf version of the book the rapture will be canceled that's crossthborder.org a little premature there on my exit uh, I was looking at the wrong count down there, but we have uh, another half hour to go. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. Uh, we're going to continue here. We got to uh, chapter 9 and verse 1, so we'll just uh, continue in our historical account of uh, a historical account of David's rule in Israel as, uh, as sole king. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was in the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mekur, the son of Amal, Amiel, in Lodibar. And king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for, thy, for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba to the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and was lame in both his feet. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun, the son, his son, reigned in his stead. 
Then said David, I will show, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came to the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, Their lord, thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that, thou, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and overthrow it? Wherefore Hanan took David's servants, shaved off the one half of their beards, and cut off their garments in the middle, even to the buttocks, and sent them away. Then they told David, told it unto David. He sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and the king of Maacah, 1,000 men, and of ish 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab, and all the hosts of the mighty men, and the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and Rehob and Ishtob and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then shalt thou help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. For the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And Joab drew nigh, and the people that were with him, unto the battle against the Syrians. And they fled before him. And when the children of Mon saw that the Syrians were fled, then fled they also before Abishai, and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the children of Ammon, and came unto Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten, before Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadad Ezer, or Hadar Rezer, this is a similar name, not Hadad Ezer, it's Hadar Rezer, uh, sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the river, and they came to Helam and Shobach, the captain of the hosts of Hadad Rezer, went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam, Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel. And David slew the men of 700 chariots, the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen and smote, and, and smote Shobak, the captain of their hosts, who died there. And when all the kings that were servants to the Hadad Rezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel. Good idea. <laughs> it served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. And it came to pass... After the year was expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rehbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the eventide that David arose from off his bed, and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sat and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, 
the daughter of Aliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. David's mistake. I mean, it's one thing. David was not in battle. David, I mean, that's, that's the note we get here. That uh, it was the time of battle, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. David was not where he was supposed to be. That's uh, mistake number one. And uh, what do you do when you have idle time and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing? Well, that's time to get into trouble. And David got into trouble. Temptation came upon him. Nothing wrong with seeing a beautiful woman, except this beautiful woman was taking a bath, and rather than focusing on her, he should have turned his eyes away from her. That was mistake uh, number one. Mistake number two, well, was inquiring of her, and perhaps that, that's not such a great sin. But when he heard that it was the wife of Uriah, then he should have paid attention to the law of God because adultery is a terrible sin in the eyes of our God. And I'm a single man because my late wife died and uh, my first two wives ran off because they were wicked and they did wickedly. And so I'm here uh, without a wife, without a help me, uh, even still having children to deal with and a household to take care of, not to mention working full time in my ministry and uh, the other things that I have to do. And I'm looking for a wife. And where do I look for a wife? Well, the internet today is the, is the place to look if you can't find one near you. Uh, and I can't find one near me. None are knocking on my door. I don't work with any women because <laughs> I work uh, in my own place. So I go on the internet and to so-called Christian sites. And I say so-called Christian sites because I believe that most of the women on there are not really Christians. And I think about this often, what David did here. And it's very important to me that before I consider a woman that I find out about her past. Did she, is she lawfully divorced? Now, I don't care if she's got a piece of paper from the state saying she's divorced. I care about, is she lawfully divorced according to the law of God? What, did she leave her husband unlawfully? Did she commit adultery? Did she have a lawful cause or did her husband abandon her? Or if she did leave her husband, did she repent? And when she repented, seek to be reconciled to her husband and then was rejected or freed by him? Because if he rejects her, if a woman leaves her husband then seeks, as the scripture says, Paul says, remain single or be reconciled to your husband. That's what we have from Paul. And here we're getting back into the whole betrothal, marriage, and divorce thing, which is a special focus of mine. Uh, having done and studied these things, I uh, pay special attention to them when they uh, come to the front as we're going through the scripture, and this is coming to the front here. So when I have occasion and I'm on the internet, and looking for a wife and considering all these women, I find that most of them have to be rejected, even though they're attractive and they seem like good prospects for a wife. Some of them very young and very beautiful, but none of that matters to me. I'd rather have an ugly, faithful woman than a beautiful, unfaithful woman. I'd have a, rather have an ugly woman that honors the law of God than the most beautiful woman and the most prosperous woman that dishonors the law of God or has no regard for it, has left her husband for a light reason. And I talk to him and I find out, and that's the first thing I find out, are they lawfully separated from their husband? Is their separation from their husband a lawful reason? Are they free, in other words, from their husband? And if they're not, I don't want nothing to do with them because the law of God is before my eyes. And the law of God is what I use to separate, well, the sheep from the goats when it comes to finding a mate. And I find out that on most of these so-called Christian sites that they are mostly goats. Be careful, men. That's all I've got to say. It would be better for you to remain single than to have a goat 
in your midst, it would be much better. And yes, I'm, so I'm still uh, separating the sheep from the goats and looking for a good woman and uh, a hard thing to find. Uh, and we'll see what the, the Lord has for me. Like I said, I would rather uh, be single and do the work of the Lord because I know that he can prosper me in ways that uh, I cannot be prospered in the flesh. So though I am a man, and I have the desires of a man, and it would be nice to have a help meet because I have so much work to do here that I really do need help. <laughs> At least I think I do. And he said it himself, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And uh, yes, he gave me a good one, but she died uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, he allowed that all to happen and come about. But I'm still here to do his his will and and his work every day of my life regardless i will work what he with what he gives me so anyway considering these things david should have had the law of god before his eyes but the temptation was strong upon him and we should never underestimate the temptation we should always seek to have temptation as as yahshua jesus said he said if thy eye cause thee to offend pluck it out in other words, he's saying, don't allow your eyes to set you up to fall. Whatever it is that would cause you offense is to remove it from your sight and get it out of your life. And watch out for occasions. Be wise in the way you walk. Don't walk into an occasion where you will be tempted and overcome because we are just men. You know, take heed uh, where you stand lest you fall. And I am just a man. I am not so prideful that I think I'm all that, that I think I've reached some state of sinless perfection and I can't fall. I don't ever want to reach the point where I stand in my own pride. Let me be proud of the work that God is doing in me. Let me be proud that it's his staff that I'm leaning upon. And sometimes I have to catch and call out for his hand as I'm falling down. And let me, oh, absolutely, immediately, if I fall, immediately call out for him to pull me back up because he is faithful. He will. But like I said, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation. And we can, uh, we can use that in context here for David. There is no temptation except such as is common to man. We need to keep that in the front of our eyes. I could fall like David fell because all temptation is common. But God is faithful, who with every temptation makes a way of escape. Let us learn to always look for the escape when we're tempted. And let us learn that, yes, we can be over, so overwhelmed because of what we are by temptation that we lose sight of looking for a way of escape. And we need to wholly rely on our Heavenly Father, His Holy Spirit, and the imputed righteousness of Yahshua, our Messiah. But let us continue here with all that in mind. It came to pass in the eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof, and he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look at. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And as soon as he heard wife, he should have said, eh, you know, shut it off, walked away from it. It would be adultery. I can't even allow myself to be tempted any further. Unfortunately, that is not what happened. Unfortunately for David. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came unto him and he lay with her. Now, David sent messengers and took her. Now, the implication here is force. He took her by force, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah to hit the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto David, David demanded of him how Joab did. 
and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house, and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said to Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down to thine house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to mine house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest, and as thy soul liveth? I will not do this thing. And oh boy, this, that's a rebuke for David too. Not that Uriah would have any intentions of rebuking the king. But the rebuke is there for David who was tarrying in Jerusalem when he should not have been taking his leisure. And of course the trouble that followed. So David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also till and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Treachery. How could you know this man, after God's own heart, be so blinded? It's a warning to all of us. Uh, let us never become so careless to think that we could not fall. May his Holy Spirit remind us of what we are when we need to be reminded of what we are that we don't fall like David. Yes, I want to be like David, a man after God's own heart. But I do not want to fall like David fell so that he committed adultery, blinded by the passion of his flesh, blinded by that temptation, blinded by idleness when he should have been busy about the Lord's work. Yes, there's a time to relax, but you don't take a vacation in the middle of a battle while everyone else is battling. You get weary to the bone just like they get weary to the bone. You rest like they rest, as Uriah the Hittite proclaimed and exclaimed to David. So just one thing after another, and now it's murder. It's idleness, falling for the temptation, adultery, and now murder. He puts him in the front of the battle. He plans the death of a man. And we'll end it there today. You've been listening to Cross the Border. We'll see you next time. So as always, in everything you say and in everything you do, bless his holy name. Hallelujah.